Amen, amen, amen. Good morning. Happy December, everyone. This is the most wonderful time of the year, isn't it? I mean, isn't it? It's supposed to be, right? Is, is it the most wonderful time of the year? And you say it with kind of like a half smile, half hurt at the same time? Huh? I, I happen to really like this time of year. I love fall, winter. I do love snow. Before I hear all the gripes and complaints, remember your choice to live in New York. All right, remember that choice. I do love me some snow, and normally by now we already have a snowfall. Um, it's kind of it's hunting season, and normally during hunting season there is a little bit of snowfall. You can walk through the woods and enjoy the beauty that God has for us. But anyway, it is the most wonderful time of the year, and yes, it is Christmas time. If you were here early before the countdown, we had some Christmas music playing. It's what we, we now have transitioned into the holiday season. And because of that, we are in our Christmas series today called Christmas. For all my Boricuas in the house, Christmas, Christmas, it's the word Christmas, but if we just put a little Spanish flair on it and we call it Christmas, it would mean more Christ, more Christ, right? More Christ. My wife happens to be Spanish, so every now and then uh, we, we kind of speak Spanglish in the house. Um, we call certain words by Spanish terms and then everything else is English. <laughs> so, anyway. In my life, uh, growing up as a teenager, I struggled with this concept of more Christ. Um, I, I've always kind of had a, I've always been an intense person. I've always been very, uh, I got spanked a lot, let's put it that way. I got spanked a lot. Uh, my parents believed a spank in a day kept the devil away. <laughs> so even if I was somewhat well behaved, I probably still got a spanking just to make sure that I remembered not to do something bad the next day. Huh? And um, I just kind of, not that my parents raised me this way, but I had this idea in my mind well into my teenage years that I needed to get more God in my life. If I just had more Jesus, I could be a better person. If I just had more Jesus in my life, maybe I could behave better. If I had more Jesus, maybe I wouldn't be so angry all the time. If I had just a little bit more Jesus, maybe I wouldn't be a bully. Come on, somebody. Has, has that ever going through your mind? Has it ever been a struggle? I need more God in my life. I need more Jesus. I need more God. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes today about maybe where we got that idea from, where that philosophy came to the church. And uh, let's look at this very, very important scripture. It's in John 3, verse 30. And this is really the beginning of Jesus's ministry a little bit of background. Jesus had a cousin. His name was John. John, from the womb, was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a prophet. He was weird. <laughs> I mean, the dude wore sackcloth and ate locusts and honey and just weird stuff. Like, you could just, you could go have a sandwich. Why are you choosing to eat locusts, Right? But he was this, this prophet. He was one crying out. He was preparing the way for Jesus. And in John 3, verse 30, John says this statement. He says, Jesus must increase. He must increase. And I must decrease. And so this philosophy comes into the church. I must decrease. And I need to get more of God in my life. If I can just increase who God is in my life, then I can be better and I can be stronger and I can, huh? Has this ever been something in your mind? If I just get more God in my life, 
everything would be better. John is saying, I must decrease that he might increase. And Christians use this statement to tell themselves that they need more Jesus. But can we go, let's look at the context of what this passage uh, contains. What is the context behind that one verse? You cannot, in good Bible study, you cannot take one verse and preach it as doctrine. We have to know what is the context that that one verse is spoken about. So let's read the context. John 3, verse 22, it says this. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized So now Jesus is doing what John the Baptist was doing. He's doing the same kind of ministry. They're now both baptizing. Now John was also baptizing near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. So you got John just down the river, Jesus just up the river. Plenty of water. Then an argument breaks out between John's disciples And kind of Jesus' disciples, other people who were doing ceremonial washing. And they came to John and they said, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the side of the Jordan, the one who who you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. Hey, John, everyone's leaving your church (laughs) and going over to Jesus' church. Everybody's leaving your ministry and they're following Jesus's ministry. This is what they're saying. They're leaving your teachings, your ministry, and they're going to Jesus's ministry. And then John is simply saying, well, duh, my ministry has to decrease and his ministry has to increase. He's not saying him as a person needs to diminish. He's not saying that he as a person needs to be any less. He's just saying my entire ministry was preparing me for this moment. I was called to to prepare the way of the Lord. And that's what I've done. So now that my ministry is coming to an end, the ministry must decrease that his ministry would increase. That's simply all it's saying. Because I need to tell you a statement today. You cannot increase the amount of Jesus that you have in your life. I know. I know. I know. That's a hard one. Don't believe me. Go look it up. Go read some scriptures. Don't believe that statement that I just said. But you cannot Get more Jesus in you. You got it all at salvation. Everything that you are ever going to get from God, he deposited in you at the moment of salvation. Yet, it will be a lifelong journey to renew your mind to that reality, to renew your mind, to overcome the the desires of the flesh to that reality. That becomes the journey. But if we can, but, but, but if the enemy or our own mind can get us fixated on getting more of something that we cannot get, we won't make any progress. Literally what you're trying to say is, If I just got more of God, if God just did more, it would make it easier for me to be better. They say, wait, I did it all. I did everything that I was going to do. At the moment of salvation, you received all of Jesus that you were ever going to get. The Bible says this, that you get the measure of God, the measure, right? Now, whether that was a tablespoon or a cup or eight cups, whatever the measure was, you got it. You got the measure. You get it all. He says that he's given you all things that, per- I'm getting loud. He's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. You get it all. 
Now, we do hear well-intentioned believers saying, I just need more of Jesus. What the church needs is just more Jesus. <laughs> the only way the church gets more of Jesus is if he returns for the church. And if he returns for the church, guess what? You're bye-bye. You're not here. You're in heaven. So just, let's just think about that for a second. I just need me some more Jesus. Well, the only way to get that is to go to heaven. So now we have to look at what do we have? What do we do? What is the struggle? But I want to give you the punchline today and why I have this baby on me. I want to tell it to you like this. Here's the punchline today. A little Jesus is more than enough. A little Jesus is more than enough. A little Jesus in your life is more than enough. God sent his son to the earth in the form of a child to confound the, wise, the wisdom of the world, yes. to mess it all up. Let's take a look at this. Let's look at a prophecy by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is prophesying the coming of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah. In Jeremiah 23, 5, he says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Woo! Power. Powerful statement right there. I mean, just that, the Lord our righteousness. Powerhouse. Powerful statement. But he says that there will be a king coming from the lineage of David who will reign and, and execute judgment and righteousness. And this just seems so powerful. And because of this prophecy, Israel was expecting a king to arrive on a majestic horse followed by his entourage, like something out of the movie Aladdin with Will Smith. Huh? This is what they were expecting and the people would praise him and the people would bow down and people are doing cartwheels and flips and tambourine. Look at this. Amazing. But that's not what we got. We didn't get Will Smith. We didn't get elephants and horses. We didn't even get Boss Baby. We got a simple baby in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. And that's actually a really bad picture because those three dudes weren't there. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, we just got a baby in a carrier in a cloth. This is it. Just this. And guess what? This was more than enough. This was more than enough. A little Jesus is more than enough. The prophet Isaiah pinned it perfectly in his prophecy. In Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, he says this, For unto us, a child is born, and I go back to my choir days. For unto us a child is born, right? Unto us a son is given. Unto us, unto us, right? Watch this. And the government will be upon his shoulders. I'm not going to get political today, but could you rest in faith? knowing that the governments would be on his shoulders. Just a little Jesus. And the government will be on his shoulders. And his name will be called 
wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This child that was born unto us would be all these things. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Baby Jesus, born in Bethlehem, was exactly what the world needed. This is not what we wanted. We wanted a warrior king. We wanted someone to come and punch people in the mouth. We wanted to bomb people. And we got a baby. Couldn't feed himself. Couldn't care for himself. Couldn't wash himself. In need that someone feed him. In need that someone care for him. In need that someone provide for him. That's what we got. And that was more than enough to revolutionize the world. Yes. A little Jesus is more than enough. But we all know the truth. He didn't stay a baby. He didn't stay a baby. He didn't stay in infancy, needing somebody to care for him. Somebody come grab this from me. I don't want to drop baby Jesus on the floor. Get bad emails and messages on Facebook. He didn't stay a baby. He didn't stay at the infancy stage. And I would hope that none of us stay at infancy stage spiritually. I would hope that none of us are, are only feeding on the word of God on a Sunday morning for 35 minutes. I would hope that we take the example of what God put in front of us. That yes, when we come into the body of Christ, that when we come to salvation, we are an infant. But that there will be stages of growth that we should experience in our lives. We do not stay infancy. The Bible says that Jesus grew in strength and in stature. He became the savior of the world by laying his life down for us on the cross. He became sin for us and paid the price for sin for all eternity. So I'm going to tell you this today. All we need is a little Jesus in order to handle the huge issues of our lives. All we need is a little Jesus to handle the issues of our lives. Your problem and my problem has never been, as Christians, that we didn't have enough Jesus. That was never the problem. The, your problem's never been that you didn't have enough Jesus. Mm. It's like this. It's like saying that you ain't got no money but you refuse to use your debit card to go get cash out of the ATM. You have the money in the bank, but you're too lazy. I'm too lazy, whoever, too lazy to get in the car, drive to the ATM, and take it out. It's there, but you ain't using it. It's there, but you're not accessing it. It's there, but you got to put some work into it to go get it. Put your pin code in, and I hope it's not one, two, three, four. And get out what's been deposited. You got to get what's been deposited out and applied to your life. You either have Jesus or you don't. You either have him or you don't. It's not about how much of him you have is do you have him? Do you have him? Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? And I'm asking you this. Please don't just know about him. Know him. The devil knows about him. 
The devil knows about the book of Revelation and what the end is. He knows how to try to take you out because of what the book tells him. But do you know what Jesus wanted to say to you today? Do you know what your daily bread was? He said, I am the bread of heaven. So what's your daily bread? Did you get your daily bread today? When you woke up this morning, did you get in contact with the savior of your soul? The one who you will worship for all eternity, singing holy is the one who is and is to come. Did you say hi today? Do you know him? You can't get more of God. You can't get more of Jesus. But what you can do is get more of you into him. You can get more of you in line with who he is. You can definitely surrender more of your will, more of your desires, more of your thoughts, more of the words that are coming out of your mouth. You can definitely surrender more of who you are to who he is. But it's never a matter of his deficiency in your life. It's always us. It's always us. It's always us. Listen. If you look back at every bad decision you ever made, it's probably because you already made the decision and then asked God to co-sign on it. Instead of asking up front, should I make this decision? No emotions tied to it, yay or nay, and then follow him. Normally it's you already decided it. And then when it didn't work out, you wanted him to bail you out. Come on, somebody. You can get more of you into who he is. So I got a couple questions. Have you gotten yourself into the things of God? Does reading your Bible on your own time outside of church interest you? Does listening to Christian music interest you? Have you taken the time to accept the free gift of eternal life? through Jesus Christ? And then have you also then pursued the extra gifts that he says, come along with that? Because when you get saved, you get the whole key ring. You get all access. You have all access to all the things of God. But the journey of life is to go through that key ring and try all the different doors to find out how it works and how they open. Have you tried prophesying? Have you tried laying hands on the sick? Come on, I'm just throwing some stuff out here. Have you tried speaking in other tongues? It's all in the key ring. It's all in the key ring. It's so easy for people to sit back and say, oh, that passed away with the apostles. Well, did you try it? Did you try it? And did you try it with your mind out of the way? Did you try it with your pride out of the way? Come on, I'm just throwing some stuff out today, guys. What what I'm saying is you're not going to get more of God, but you can unlock the gifts that he already deposited in you. You can get out your house, get in your car, go to the bank, and make a withdrawal from what God deposited in you. It's in you. As we close today, the next 11 minutes, I want to share with you three truths. Three truths about your salvation. And they're found in Romans 5, verse 1. It says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, I just want to ask, do you have have peace today? Someone who's watching online, you're at home, do you have peace today? Through salvation, we have peace with our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also, also we have access by faith into this grace, in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Three things I want to look at today is this. The first one is this. The scripture says that you have peace with God and that that peace with God, it takes care of our past. Peace with God takes care of your past. Takes care of your past. If you ever experience anxiety, And I'm talking about real anxiety. I'm not just talking about, oh, you thought about something and it bothered you for three seconds. But I'm talking about anxiety where your chest got tight and you tried to like catch your breath. Anxiety normally occurs 
because you're dwelling on the past. You're dwelling on what if, what could have happened if. So let me give you an example. One of the worst anxiety attacks I ever caught um, we were, me, me and, uh, um, and John DeGroat were cutting out a hole in my basement. We were cutting out eight inch thick concrete slab to put double doors, uh, in my basement. And, uh, John walks up, he goes, well, let me just see where we're at with the wall. And when he, when he pushed it, the whole thing fell over just in one chunk, fell over right out, right outside the house. And, uh, we just, you know, we were laughing or whatever, like, oh man, that was crazy. And then I started thinking, my son Liam was just standing right there five minutes ago. And I just, in my mind, oh my gosh, like that was, what would have happened if we would have did that when my son was standing right there? And I just, but it didn't happen. But I got my chest tight and I started sweating. I couldn't breathe for something that didn't even happen. And that's the state that the enemy wants you to live in is looking in the rearview mirror of your life, dwelling on and contemplating your past. And that's why the grace of God and the peace of God and the, and the, and the sacrifice that Jesus made is so important because it says, I cut the ties between your present and your past. That's no longer who you are. God's not against you. And knowing that we are forgiven and knowing that we are righteous, it gives you overwhelming peace. We have peace that surpasses all understanding because a little bit of Jesus is more than enough to bring you overwhelming peace. Whether you, whether you think hunting is wrong or not, I'm not going to tell you any weird hunting story, but the other day I was out hunting. I was in the woods. I was up in a tree stand, and I was out, I was out in mountain country. I mean, we were out there. And I don't know what happened. Maybe there was like a shift in the, in the, in the forest or whatever, but all of a sudden it went quiet. Like there was noise, there was birds chirping, and all of a sudden it just went quiet. And when I tell you eerie quiet, we're like, you could hear your nostril hairs moving as you're breathing quiet. Like, it was almost uncomfortably quiet. Some of the other guys that were up there with me, they, they, they noticed the same thing. It happened like three or four times while we were up there. And that's kind of like that, the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's almost overwhelming. It's almost uncomfortable it's so peaceful <laughs> because we're not used to it. That's what he wants to bring into your life. In John 14, 27, it says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not your peace. Not what you can think up. Not what you can put together. Not what you can muster up in your strength. My peace I give you. And I don't give it to you like the world does. I gave it all. I don't give the world's Indian givers, man. The world gives it and they say, oh, you ain't using it. I right, just give it back. I don't give like the world gives. I don't give incrementally. I gave it all. He says, so don't let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. The second thing we get at salvation is access to God. And this access to God takes care of our present. It takes care of today. So we talked about he took care of yesterday. Our access to God takes care of today. We can come to God any time that we need help. We can come to God any time that we're feeling weak that we're feeling like we can't do it. In the New Testament, we're introduced to a brand new topic called righteousness, right standing with God. But the best part of righteousness is when God, when, when Paul calls it the righteousness of God. 
the righteousness of God. And I'm going to do my best to pronounce this word in the Greek. And I know I got several Greek scholars in the room who are going to tell me later, but I listened to it like 9 million times on YouTube, somebody else saying it. It's the word dekaiosine. Dekaiosine. Dekaiosine theo is the righteousness of God. And this righteousness is outside of man's ability. This righteousness you cannot do even by living to the letter of the law. You could be the best person in the world and it still fails in comparison to dekaiosinetheo, the righteousness of God. And this word dekaiosinetheo holds such weight. It's a transforming righteousness. It's a transforming righteousness, which means it's not even the same righteousness tomorrow that it is today. That my standing with God gets better and better and better the closer that I come to the end of my life. Dude, that's, that's crazy. It's a heavy, heavy term. And what this term does is gives man permission to access the presence of God Almighty. This term right here, the righteousness of God, gives man access to the presence of God Almighty. And the key to that access is salvation through Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus that we have access. He's the key. Because a little bit of Jesus, just a key-sized Jesus, is all we need. It's more than enough to access the presence of God. And the third thing that I want to leave you with today is that he gives us the hope of glory. The hope of the glory of God takes care of our future. The hope of the glory of God takes care of the future. One day we will share in his glory, the Bible says, knowing that we are justified, that we are at peace with God, and that we can freely enter his presence. We now have the hope of heaven. And I'm going to be honest with you about something. I don't think the church today talks enough about heaven like church of old did. Church of old talked a lot about heaven because life was so bad that they just had to have this hope that the afterlife would be better. And in general, I mean, except for the last nine months, life has been so good that you don't ever hear anybody talk about heaven because they're like, no, 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 I just want to stay here as long as I can. We don't ever want to talk about the hope of glory. It's like a foreign thing today. And I'm not going to talk about it today. Maybe we will this year. But the hope of eternity, the hope of having access to God Almighty and be in his presence starts at receiving Jesus Christ into your life. Just receiving a little bit of Jesus. It's what gets you into heaven. A little Jesus is more than enough to revolutionize your eternity. And I'm just gonna ask you today, have you taken that step? If you're watching online, have you taken that step? This is the Christmas season. The entire season, listen, don't don't, don't be fooled that it's about Santa and his elves. It's about Jesus Christ, the anointed one, and his anointing. It's about the greatest gift that came to the, to the earth to save your spirit man, that it could dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the Christmas message. That's the season that we celebrate. I want to tell you this today. A little Jesus, a little Jesus in your life is more than enough. Next week... We are going to talk about Christmas again. It's the whole season. But we're going to ask this. Have you seasoned the bland? No, I'm sorry. Have you added Jesus to the bland seasons of your life? Have you added Jesus to the bland seasons of your life? Both are play on words. Both weeks have been play on words. But I've never tasted such seasoned food until I married 
into a Hispanic house. I mean, they don't just buy the little season boxes. They get the adobo like this size. It lasts like three weeks. That's it. It's adobo everything, adobo and eggs for the breakfast. I mean, at my family, we had a pinch of salt. Now it takes seven ingredients to add to just be salt. Like you got sazon, you got adobo, you got sofrito. You got to add more garlic on top of that. Come on, somebody. I'm hungry. It's lunchtime. <laughs> Have you added Jesus to the bland seasons of your life? I believe God wants to do something with the broken parts of our past. I think God wants to use what the enemy meant for evil for his glory. I think God wants to use your experiences, your hurts, your habits, your hangups, to free and liberate somebody else through your story, through your accountability, through your friendship. I believe that God wants to do that. If you would add a little Jesus to the bland seasons of your life, God would use those moments to reach somebody else. If you're here today, you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you don't have this access that we're talking about. We wanna offer that to you today. And we do that with a simple prayer and it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type AMEN in all capital letters and one of our online hosts will reach out to you and follow up with you. We'd love to give you a six day devotional called Starting Point, which will help you get started in your walk with Christ. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you give me the honor to take two seconds and celebrate you? Would you just wave at me and say, hey, that was me. I prayed for the very first time today. Anybody real quick looking across the room Nope. Okay, awesome. If you did and you just don't want to raise your hand, you can also pick up that starting point book at our Welcome Center. It is a six-day devotional that gets you started. We're almost totally complete with our online interactive portal to that. Uh, where it will text message a link to a daily video that will walk you through that six days. Well, it's going to be really cool, uh, but we're working on it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today that your word will never return to you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. I thank you today, Holy Spirit, that faith would rise in our hearts, that we would not let the circumstances around us get into us and infect us or affect us. I thank you, Holy Ghost, that you are that strong tower within us, empowering us, guiding us, comforting us, counseling us, and leading us. We thank you, Lord, today as we leave here, that everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all.